Good morning, everybody. I'm Laura Affelbeck. Um, I'm going to introduce a little bit about the topic in terms of what we did. And then our goal for today is to help you determine what might be an appropriate target audience in your own community so that you can begin thinking about how you could reach them and uh, fill the gap between where you are now and where you'd like to be with that programming. In Manitowoc County, all of us <laughs> were working on uh, projects independently. Did I forget something already? You guys are looking at me like I forgot something. No, okay. <laughs> we were all working with the Hmong population, but from slightly different directions. Foodwise is a program that works with low income audiences that are SNAP eligible. And we, treat, we teach nutrition education in that context with the idea of preventing obesity. Each of my colleagues has a different piece of that program. Our Hmong community is um, typically in, the, in our elder Hmong community, there are a lot of people who have multiple issues that they are trying to uh, work around. And um, immigrants, immigrant status is, of course, one. And I have those outlined. We have outlined them on the mini version of the poster that we had up yesterday, if you went to see Gajua yesterday. Um, so the immigrant status, poverty, there are many factors that we're playing um, a role here. And what we wanted to do was to coordinate the efforts of our organizations to offer culturally appropriate food through the ADRC, the Aging and Disabilities Resource Center, to our Hmong elders at a senior nutrition site. What I had found, what I, was my eureka moment for this audience, was that I, I was invited to attend a picnic. Neng Li Vang in, invited me to attend a picnic of the Hmong elders in a group that she was working with. And we introduced ourselves and we talked about, just as an icebreaker, we wanted to talk about things we were grateful for. And we each went around and talked about something we were grateful for. And these women, almost to a person, said, I'm so grateful to be here today. So I'm looking at a group of 60-year-old, 70-year-old women whose primary gratitude was just to be there at the Lincoln Park Zoo in a field house having brats, right? And I thought, why is this? They all, a lot of them live in the same town. They don't necessarily live far from one another, so they weren't seeing one another. And that was a concern because we know socialization is one of the the issues for older people. So we said, OK, we need to reach this audience, right? So this is what we did. We made an effort to reach this Hmong audience, primarily females, primarily older. And this was a gap in my service, and it was a gap in services for some of, some of our, the others. W this was our gap audience. Can you think of a gap audience in your own community, a, a sub-community? a subsection of your community that is not currently being reached by your services. Yeah? You think of someone? I know in Brown County we have a Somali population, an immigrant Somali pop population that is an underserved audience, right? If you live near a reservation, it might be that audience. It might be the LGBTQ audience in your community that is underserved. It might be low-income parents. It might be teen mothers. But thinking about what is your target audience, then you can perhaps consider this to be your gap in your services and think about, well, how are we going to get from where we are now to where we'd like to be, which is, I assume, meeting their needs, right? Well, to do that, the first thing we had to think about is what are the barriers they face? We're talking about 60 and 70 year old Hmong women. We were hoping at that time to, to include the men, but that's not how things turned out. So we were thinking about the, the, the barriers that they face in order to attend services like the ADRC was providing in our community. Meals, right? Meals are good. Nutrition is good. Socialization is good. I was working with all of the senior meal sites in Manitowoc and Kiwani counties, we saw no Hmong people ever, even though they make up 5% of our population. We saw very few Latino families coming, elders coming to these meals. So our goal was to figure out why this is the case, right? And we were brainstorming, well, you know, 
why is this the case? I, I'm not going to figure it out on my own. I need to consult with other people, <laughs> other people who know the audience far better than I do. Um, and, what, and that's what we did. And uh, Neng Li and Erica will talk more about that. But we, we identified certain barriers that we knew would exist. These are people who immigrated, so we knew that language would be a barrier. Uh, many Hmong people that in the elder population did not have the written language in any, any language, Hmong, English, anything. They did not read or write in any language. Uh, many of them had childcare responsibilities at home, even as older people, they were taking care of their grandchildren. So that would be an obstacle to coming to an ADRC sponsored meal site, right? Um, another obstacle was that many of them did not drive. And if you can imagine being someone who does not read or write in any language and trying to navigate the public transportation system, if you have, and we had a bus system that ended usually at by eight o'clock at night, sometimes did not get very close to the, where they lived. So yes, all those things on top of, and our more rural counterparts didn't even have that. So if you don't drive and you can't take the bus, you're not going very far, right? You're gonna be relying on your relatives who probably have jobs and children and other obligations. So, we had a lot of things we knew, but we knew because we asked them, right? That's the key. You got to ask the, the people in the audience, what are the obstacles? How significant are those barriers is my next question. So which, what are the top things? And again, how do you think we figured that out? <laughs> yeah, you got to ask them because, I mean, sometimes what we thought might be a huge obstacle was in not, not in fact the biggest obstacle. So what we thought was language and what we thought was the food that they offered because I was, for me, I was imagining my 85-year-old my immigrant, well, child of immigrant German stock, my, my father, and would he go to a meal site that offered Asian food? Would he walk into a room full of Asian people? No, you know, so I could look at these women and think, boy, you know, I can see one obstacle. They're not gonna walk into a whole room of their peers who are older, probably Slavic and German ancestry people and eat meat and potatoes, right? So we had to think about the food as an obstacle, the language as an obstacle. What about the site? Well, they weren't going to the seniors, senior centers and the meal sites at all. So there is no comfort level there. We had to find a site that would be comfortable, someplace they had been before. And we know they want to have fun. They don't want to just go there. If I tell them they can come and see me and talk about nutrition education for an hour, oh, come on. We'll do some fun games, right? Are they going to come? No, they're not there to see me. <sighs> <laughs> So we're thinking about, okay, how can we brainstorm some solutions to these problems? And again, am I doing this in my office by myself with the other white chicks? No, I gotta get the, the target audience needs to be involved, right? Yeah, and I'm not the target audience. I'm probably getting close to the right age demographic, but the rest of it is out of my league. So I'm consulting everybody I know, and they're consulting with me because we see this as a shared problem for a segment of our community. And fortunately, I happen to know some people who are from that community who could kind of help me wedge my way in, right? Um, so I wanted to think about, okay, we know transportation is, an op is it going to be an obstacle. What are some problems? What, what, well, I'm sorry, what are some solutions to that problem? So can we have people ride together, right? If one person can drive, can that person pick up several? Can we use a public transportation system? Can we figure out a way to make that work? Uh, taxi service is probably out of our league, right? And then we found out about assist to transport. <clears throat> Do you guys have assist to transport or something like that where you can take a van for medical purposes, right? A lot of communities do, but if you don't read or write in, in English and nobody has explained this to you, how in the, or even if someone has, how are you gonna call on the phone to schedule a ride if they don't speak Hmong and you don't speak English? And then what are you going to do when some guy in a van shows up and you can't read the sign on the side of the van? Are you going to get in that van? Right? And if he takes you to the wrong place, how are you going to tell him? 
So there were obstacles within obstacles within obstacles, so we were trying to figure that out. And then with language services, well, do we have a budget to hire an interpreter? Can we use any technology to help us? And then there's food. How many caterers do you know who will cook traditional Hmong foods? Right? Okay, so we could have delivery, we could cook it ourselves, but then you have to have a certified kitchen and a licensed cook. So again, obstacles within obstacles within obstacles. So, you have your target audience in mind. What do you see as their barriers? Can you think of some? Anybody willing to share? Who your target audience is? Who you'd like to be meeting that you're not? Yeah, they're afraid. I'm sorry? sorry? They are afraid. Yes. It's an, an unknown situation. Yes. And fear or comfort level is huge, right? So how do you deal with that? What are some ways that you might help them move beyond the fear? Yeah, right? It's a tough thing. So do you use a buddy system? And this is one way where Gajua, who did not want to stand up here and speak with us, was very helpful because she put information out on Facebook for us and used social media, not for the benefit of the elders who are not using social media because they don't read, <laughs> right? And they're, they're older, so they're not typically using social media, but their children do. So we could get to the children. And she would call up people that she knows, as did Nang Lee, and say, you should come and bring your neighbor. Bring your aunt, bring your sister, right? So we're kind of wedging ourselves in. <laughs> wedging ourselves in. The other thing I want you to think about is not only what you can do to help bridge the barriers that you know are there, or help overcome the barriers that you know are there, but also, what are the things that people are going to do, and you know this will happen? What are the things that people are going to do? What would they do to stop you? Come on, you know. What do people do to stop you? If you have a new and innovative idea to reach a new community, what are you often told? Excuse us. It hasn't worked in the past. Oh, it has never worked before. We tried this in 1978. I'm sorry? I don't think they'll participate. Oh, they're not going to come. They won't participate. Yeah, we've worked with that audience before. They're not coming. Yeah. But change is hard. Oh, nobody likes change but a wet baby, right? They're, change is hard. This is going to take forever. We're never, we don't have the time. We need to see results, right? Do they ever cut your funding? We don't have any money for this, right? Um, it's outside your program parameters. Have you heard? Yeah, I see you laughing. <laughs> yeah, we all heard that because this is not with, you know, absolutely um, perfectly within any of our program parameters, but it was a huge need, and we saw that. So you got to work creatively within your, you know, so you have to think about, that's called like reverse brainstorming. How would people stop this if they could? <laughs> um, and then think about what you're going to do or say or who can help you with that often huge issue of um, trying to garner support. Um, or it's not a priority at this time. Oh, okay. These people are 80 years old. How much time do you <laughs> We need to get moving on this. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. Um, my parting thought to you before I turn it over to Nang Li Vang is the importance of re relationships, because we all know this. And we have, to, we have to continually work on it, that relationships work only when we break each other's walls down and fight to understand each brick. And then maybe we can make some progress, right? All right. So um, Nang Lee was instrumental with our communication issues. So she's going to talk about that. So I'm going to talk more specific on the program that we just event and happened this year. But the Hmong Senior Meal is, we talk about many years before she even come. We know that's something that we need to do it, but we couldn't find a place because my office is really have no space. So we couldn't find a place to host events. Um, 
we can find people to sponsor. So we keep talking about it. So we do here and there, jump to different places all the time. And finally, we connect with Laura. So we got the UW extension, have lots and lots of space for meeting and events. So it's like, yes. So um, so we connect with her, so we uh, work with her. So then she become part of our team as uh, we have uh, family Thai events that we have a team that come and talk to each other every month and then plan the event monthly for the family and children. So she's part of the team that we add more people, then we add more people. So we have like six, seven, eight people come together, talk about what topic will we talk and um, what is it that we need to do and who are the speaker, you know. So those is kind of help. And then the senior male come in uh, with the uh, aging disability. They say, well, we wanted to help and um, buy the food we will come out with the money and buy the food if we can find some place that will be certified. So that's why we got uh, UW Extension to to be the one that certified kitchen, it, even though it's a little bit small right now, but I think it's we are happy to do that. So the bearing in the uh, Hmong community with the, this particular population is they are 60 and uh, older. So you can see that most of people don't read and write. And some of the people doesn't know where they need to go. So we will be the one that talk to them and then uh, call them. Um, so then transportation come in. So the language, I will be the main person connect with them, talk to them, call them, remind them. Um, so transportation, then we have uh, Erica sponsors to have some money so we can pay for the transportation. Even though pay 75 cents for one way, it's still hard for them to pay for that 75 cents to get there. So it was um, fortunately that we, we got that grant to help and cover and that so the woman will come. So when the woman come, we do many things in there. We do like um, education pieces, like health um, information. Uh, we do uh, education and learning by playing bingo, how to locate what is number one, number two, number three, and what's the B, what's the N, what's the G. As simple as that, they, they first time they hear, they first time they learn. So as we do more, more and more, they familiar with the words so they can do it by themselves. First, we have to stand by them and say, okay, B29, kind of go here as a B29, you know. We kind of walk with them all the time, and now I think they are more familiar with it and they do much, much better. That means they learn something, you know, even though it's just simple language that we never thought about it. So the people we target is a senior, 60 and older, because it's a federal uh, law for the um, aging disability for the male of the will. So we only have that, and right now because a whole bunch of us are women facilitate this thing, so we only get women. Our goal is we want to get the men to be there too. There's a lot of men out there too that they need some support too. So next year we'll do something, add more male to be part of it, and then see if we can reach out to the male. So where do we reach out to them? So we go to um, the restaurant, we have one Hmong restaurant in our area, so we go in there, reach out to them. We have one Hmong grocery, Hmong grocery in there, we go reach out to them, put a fly there. We go to church, uh, where are the Hmong churches? We go there, we put a fly, we talk to the pastor, we talk to the people. And then we also send fly home with the kids, send it to their parents. We do newspaper ad. Uh, Facebook, like Laura was mentioned, no, newspaper ad and Facebook and all those social media is more like for their children to see. So they can say, oh, they have a program, so I will take my mom there. Or for the service provider to see, oh, they have a program, so this, peop this person come see me, I can refer to, you know. So, but for our elders, those things mean nothing to them. You can give them the flyer, they can read they would not know and they would not understand. So it's more like I have talked to them one-on-one -on -one or talked to them as a group only. Just remind them that again and again, what is this event about? So then what do you do? You know, when we have all this transportation, we have all this language, people like myself will be the main person, and we have location, we have food, before we do this food, we do a lot of manual search for Asian manual food and send it to uh, the cater, the cook. They will try their best to cook the way is the recipe is, but doesn't sometimes doesn't turn out to be really good. But we tell the woman, say, 
don't think about the food. Think about how we are here together. But keep complaining. So I will try my best to work with them and improve the food part. Some food are good. Some food is not in the the way that they want. But they are willingly to come. As it's not so much about food. It's so much about to come here together. So who's the key leader that you you will be part of it? So like I say, we have the family tie. We have uh, human service. Uh, she's a uh, therapy and she's a mom. And we have Hester and she's a bilingual staff there, mom. And we have uh, from the Lakeshore Cab, uh, they work in the family program, and they're also bilingual Hmong. And then myself work at, from Catholic Charity, and I am also Hmong. Then we have Laura, and we have Aurora, uh, person that represent as well, to come together and talk about, say, who can we reach out to, and where can we reach out to, and what can we do. So this is the whole team that come together and we talk uh, about it. The reason I have the family tie because I, uh, my, a my agency got the grant from the fa uh, Department of Family and Children to work with uh, parents and children with a healthy relationship and also uh, safety for a family. So that's why I kind of start with that workshop and that um, small group and then we kind of grew into and expand a little bit more. So those are the key with people. So if we don't know, if you live in your town that you don't know anybody, you can searching for who is a leader in the community, uh, what kind, which club they go more, uh, where can you meet with them. So those are the things. So I'm just talk about the program that I do and how we connect it together and how we, uh, how we make it work. But like I say, by myself, even I am bilingual, I am mom. If I don't have all this partner with me, it's not happening either. Because I need location, I need money for transportation, I need money for food, um, I need some other stuff. So we need to work together as a group, as a team, in order to make it work. So I want to think about in your community, which we focus more. Even Laura talked, we, she also make you think about it. So I also want you to think about who is your audience, who is your target population in your community that you want to reach out to. Do you know who in your community yeah, you can, that you need to be reached out to because have not been served them yet? Yes, for me, for example, it's uh, farm workers. Farm workers, okay. okay. Undocum undocumented farm, farm workers. All right, so what's the barriers? What's the problem that cannot reach to them? Transportation. 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 Language. Language. They're so afraid right now of the situation okay. that they're dying. <coughs> So by knowing that, what can we do? We're trying to get mobile clinics to go with them, but it's so hard and so expensive that we have not found how to do that. Right. So I think just... I'm sorry, did you say they are dying? Yes. We have kids of 25 years that, um, because they have to work shifts of 16 hours every day from Monday to Sunday. To stay uh, awake, they drink in a lot of Red Bull and all this stuff, so they're developing a lot of diabetes and heart problems. And they're, they're young, they're dying. And sadly, we found out that some of the farms, and that was taught in one of our in one seminar that we attend, some of the owners of the farms are providing drugs so they stay awake longer. Oh. That's not good. So I mean, by knowing that, maybe come back to your community, who are the server providers that can work with this school, and then you can connect with it, work with them, you know? Like I said before, before this thing happened, I called the UW Extension and said, can I rent a play, can I reserve the play for my event? Because I don't know anybody there, they say, no, you cannot, you have to be, have a, be a member of the UW Extension to reserve the room, right? Because I'm not. So I cannot get the room. Later on, when I know Laura, I just said, Laura, can you schedule the room? We need a room, you know? So Laura just go in there and schedule the room, say what day you need, and she's blocking all the room. So we get the room. So you have to know the right people to work with. So you have to kind of searching in the community who serves this population and where can I connect with them, and that person will be the, your main person with that area. So with the uh, aging disability, we, we don't have the money to serve food but they said they wanted to be served the underserved population, so they come in. 
So they come in and they do the big part of the food and um, that. We try to introduce them to the senior center. They don't want to go because nobody speak Hmong there. The food maybe they, were, they might try, but they need someone to be there to explain what's going on. And they need to be there when they have questions. They need someone to be there that they know that if they say something that they need to know, I will be translated for them. So it's kind of difficult, but in a way, we still not give up. We still kind of do one hour event at the senior center, <coughs> monthly. So the goal is for them to familiar the building first and the location first, and it will slowly introduce them into the program. Right now, we have to tell them either the senior center or UW extension. They still don't know where's the UW extension if you say the word, but because of the economic, they just move into, so they know they go and ask for the uh, heating assistance. So they just go where you apply, you ask for he heating assistance, you know, so they know where the building is. So you almost have to know the language they are talking and where it is. This. The address, they don't know much. The building, they don't know. The location, they don't know. But they know where to get the heating assistance. Yes. So that's all you need to do. So to the end here is a reminder needed. Um, with this group, so almost with any group, but because if you work in the Caucasian area, you probably will do less than I do. Um, I work with this population. I have to work harder than anybody does because every Monday before 11 o'clock, I have to call everyone to do food count and also do a transportation count to send it to them so make sure Tuesday they got food to eat. So every Monday morning before 11 o'clock, I have to call them, call them and say, hey, are you coming, are you coming, are you coming? They say, yes, yes. Do you need transportation? Do you need transportation? They say, yes. Then I will send all this information to the right people for the food and for the transportation. But at the same time, Two hours later on, they will call back and say, oh, I will not coming. I have Dr. appointment. My son just told me. Sometimes I get mad, but sometimes I say, oh, that's OK. See you next week. You know? Because I have, I have no control of that. And they have no control of that either. So I cannot be mad at them. I just say, well, if you don't come, we just, I don't know if the aging disabilities are happy for that because if we miscount, we say 16 people, but only 15 people show up, or only 10 people show up, five people didn't show up. They are not really happy because they pay for the food, but there's nothing much we can do. And even go with this transportation too. I send them to pick up 10 people, but it's only eight people that come, and the other two, they can pick it up because they never show up. So it's always that problem, but then I have to work on my other end with the server provider to, uh, to explain why they will not be there. Either they're sick, or either the sons tell them that they have doctor appointment, or either uh, someone else say, come, let's go to another town for some, some relative events, you know. So those kind of things that happen all the time, um, and then I stop getting mad now. I just say, oh, you cannot come, that's fine, you know. Uh, or if they come, and they bring more people come without telling me. <laughs> and when they get there, I was never saying, do we have enough food, do we have enough food, you know? Uh, but the food is really a big portion, so we always give them less food to eat than supposed to get more. Um, and then more people, then we kind of divide food, eat evenly, but, um, and that's okay. That's one way to get people. You can say, oh, you don't, you did not have name on here, so you cannot eat. If you do that, people won't come. So you almost say, like, sure, 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 come, we eat together. Then you do intake with them at that moment, and say, do you interest to come back? If they interest to come back, then you do intake and spare all the information. If they, they need transportation, then you do the, um, the application as well. So I have to do the application for transportation and tell them to, here, you need to sign here before I send it to them. So I have to do all those part. The woman doesn't know what's going on, but they need all those service. So when we do at the first, first, sec, first or two section, the beginning, I have to pick them up because we don't have transportation arrangement yet. So I do a lot of pick up of people to come there and send them back home. Then my whole day is gone, so I cannot do my other job, my other thing that I need to do, which is law or paperwork, you know, <laughs> uh, all those things. So, and then um, it's a little bit difficult 
but then I'm be happy to do it because they are happy to be there. Um, they enjoy to be there. They like the game we do. They like the speaker. Uh, when the speaker, we arrange a speaker come, we tell them to talk. Don't come talk like you talk to us as a education people, but when you come, you talk in simple language. Um, we have a person to come talk about um, stroke. So when you talk about stroke, don't just talk about the fact information about stroke, but what are the signs, what's it look like, what is happening, uh, and what can you see the sign? So person, one person, the nurse come and talk about before you could see doctor, prepare yourself. So we go step by step, say maybe write it out. We say, no, that's not a good idea because they cannot write, right? <laughs> uh, so um, just thinking, rehearse by yourself first before you go talk to your doctor. So, Instead of talk about up, about the language uh, knowledge, we talk. We ask them the speaker to come talk a little bit simple language to this elder woman, and they seem to get it. They seem to understand it, and they seem to like it, and they enjoy the information. So that's what we do for them. So that's all I have. Oh, one thing I, I forget, even though we have a reminder, I mark a calendar, I give them all calendar and mark in color, um, like this, uh, when you see the color on the calendar, come for the day, but I still have to call. But I give them a calendar, or I even do a calendar like this. I just recently did another calendar. Put all the happy face on the date, and no happy face do not come. So. <laughs> But still, I still have to call them too. So uh, one, some of them can read and write, can read a little bit, they can put in it, they know, but all the people you still have to call. So right now, I do call half of the people, but the other half people I do not call because I ask them, do you want me to call? And some of them say, oh, no, I, I remember, I, don't call me. And some of, some of the women will say, call me every day because I forget. So then those people I call. So again, I'll try to be brief, but I do want to share with you guys first um, why I do this. Um, so, so we're going to talk about leveraging relationships in a minute. I have been blessed that I get to make, a, 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 I have made some wonderful connections with some wonderful uh, community leaders throughout the state uh, with the different community work that I do. And um, I had never really thought about this, but I've had this image in my mind that's popped in, into my mind for years. And last year I was talking to one of the among community leaders and they asked me, you know, just straight directly, um, they said, Erica, you know, please don't get this wrong. We really appreciate you, but I see that you're really passionate about helping us. Why do you wanna, why do you wanna work with the Hmong community so much? Why do you care about the Hmong community? And it kind of threw me off because I'd never been asked that. I've just always wanted to help people. And, and for the most part, I am Latina, so I, I, I work a lot more with our Latina population. It's just the way it works out. Um, and so I thought about it and I remember the time when I was, I want to say five years old, and I was getting on the bus with my mom, who did not speak English very well. And at that time, many, many moons ago when I was five years old, <laughs> $10 was a lot of money. And she was trying to pay the bus with $10, a $10 bill. And the bus driver kept saying, no, that's too much money. No, you need exact change. And it seemed like an eternity. It was probably maybe 10 minutes. But as a little kid, um, you know, I was feeling nervous. I was feeling scared. And, um, you know, they, they kept going back and forth. And she kept saying in her, you know, little accent, it's okay, it's okay. She knew she was giving too much money, but she couldn't explain anything more. She, she just needed to get somewhere. We were trying to get somewhere. Um, and she knew she was giving more money than was needed, but she, that's all she had. And she needed to, to get on, on the, the bus and wherever we were going. I think, I just remember in a, be ending up in a waiting room. So it was either social services or a doctor's office. I don't remember. Um, and everybody was mad on the bus. Hurry up, you know, lady, you're holding us up. And the bus driver's being mean, you know. He, he blocked the, where you would put the money in, with some kind of stick. That's all I remember. And my mom, you know, kind of like when you insist on paying, she like snuck the money in there. And she said, that's okay, that's okay. And she, she grabbed me and we sat down. Um, and he, he got really frustrated, but he ended up opening the, the little box or whatever that was with his key and he gave her the money back and he said just sit down and she was like it's okay and he said just sit down let's just go and I remember feeling confused one why is everybody mad at us we're just trying to ride the bus and two I think that man just did a nice thing for us but why did he have to be mean first <laughs> I didn't understand that's all I remember <laughs> um, so I think so so as I answered um, uh, my partner's question, I said, you know, I just remember that frustration 
And even if it's not my community, if I can be a resource to help people understand the system better or live their life better in any way, I am happy to do so. So I think that's why I do it. I had never thought about it before <laughs> until um, that image popped into my mind. And again, I have been blessed to, to work with many community leaders that, that have embraced me and, and welcomed me. And in fact, I've actually had Hmong, uh, people in the Hmong community ask me, Erica, I know you know such and such leader in the Hmong community, can you connect me? And you know, I'm very, very flattered and humbled that, oh really, you didn't get in and I did, oh my gosh. And I connect them and then I step out. That's not my business, I, I'm happy to connect you and, and then you know, that's all about them, that's their culture. So, so there you go. Um, and then, you know, so uh, again, really quick, so we're talking about rural, rural um, immigrants today, but really a lot of the stuff we're talking about applies to our cities as well, right? Um, but so as a city girl, um, you know, I, I do travel the state a lot, and I was on my way to Kiwani County, Algoma, Wisconsin. I don't know if anybody knows that area. And, I, you know, we were, I was visiting a, a food pantry that was out there, and as I was going out there, I just realized there was no gas stations, there was no stores, there were, and I looked at my GPS and it still said 40 minute drive. And I had like a moment of a, a little mini panic. And I said, oh my God, what if, my, what if I would have run out of gas right now? What if my car would have break down? What if the, I would lose signal? And I had like a panic. And I said, would anybody know to come find me? Like, what, what, you know, what do people do out here? You know? So, but I said, okay, I'm already almost there. Let me get there. Um, and it was a blessing. This was the first time I was at the, at the pantry. Um, and when I got there, there was a lot of Latino population. And it was just meant to be. I didn't, I didn't do anything special. And, and I saw a, a Latina elder. She was struggling to speak English, but she was trying as best she could. And I just kind of jumped in and said, oh, hey, how are you doing? You know, is there anything I can help you with? And she literally got tears in her eyes. And she said, I don't see a lot of Latinos out here. Thank you for talking to me. Thank you for coming out here. So I asked the, the management there, I said, do you guys get a lot of Latinos out here? And he said, well, yeah, we do. We have you know, such and such person that comes out once a month and answers those questions. And then they told me that's the only Latina they have. Then she covers, like, I don't know how many counties. And I said, well, who am I to say I can't come out here every couple months just to say hello and see what, you know, how can I help? And then, you know, once I connect with somebody, I can email, I can do a phone call, I don't always have to drive up there. But the need is there, and if I can be there, I will. So, on that note, when you try, you know, as much as we'd love to believe that we can do it all and be all, and I want all the credit, and I'm gonna be a star and, and help this community, we need partners, right? We need, we need help, as, as my colleagues had uh, mentioned already. So who serves the same audience, right? Um, you might know who you want to target already. You might have a, a person in mind, an uh, organization in mind. Do you know somebody that already knows that organization? Do you know somebody that might be more likely to get into that organization? You know, think about it, make a list, do your research, are they really the right partner? All that kind of stuff. And if you do get to connect with them, do not make it about you. Do not say, hey, I really need your help to meet my numbers X, Y, Z. Hey, how are you, what, what is your mission? How can I help what you're doing? And here's where maybe my mission might align. Can I share some of my information with, with you know, the, the community that you're serving? That's usually how you're gonna get in more than, guess what I can do for you? Or guess what I'm gonna do for the community that you haven't done yet? You know? <laughs> you big loser. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> so again, you know, on that uh, same line, you know, choosing the right partners. So they, they, they might have the same health literacy mission and they might serve the same audience, but sometimes you just don't vibe. You just, this is not the right person, you're not gonna have a good partnership and, and you just find somebody else that you might vibe better with. Um, but sometimes they're two completely different missions and you have no idea how well they're gonna work. It, may, it might be like a motorcycle group and you're trying to check blood pressures. Hey, I know you guys got this motorcycle run coming up. Can we share some health information the day before? Because you know, sometimes this population doesn't remember to check you know, their health or, or you know, whatever it might be, a healthy eating reminder when you're out at the motorcycle festival, whatever it might be. You'd be surprised how many things do align, how, how you might be able to make it fun and not, uh, you know, as my colleague said, just about insurance. Um, and then, you know, most importantly, who is culturally informed and sensitive? So being culturally sensitive is simply to be aware that all cultures are not the same and that your culture is not better than anybody else's. And when you're doing that, if you want it, for example, if we're talking about losing weight or you know, some kind of nutrition, you can't come into, or you shouldn't, I should say, you shouldn't come into, for example, the Mexican community and say, 
you know, we want to help you lose weight. Here's why you need to eat tofu from now on. <laughs> it's probably not going to work. <laughs> um, you know, and they know better. They, you know, we are, I think most of us, and even all these communities, we could write a book about what you're supposed to do, right? Why aren't we doing it? You know, so here's the steps. You know, let me show you how to make enchiladas healthier. Let me show you um, this new avocado salad. You're more likely to get them engaged than saying, here's this new food you've never had before because XYZ said you should be eating it. Um, and, and so this is truly, truly not personal. I, and I've said this, and I think a lot of people in here already know this. It, it's not personal, but if you are reaching out to a community of color, the person best suited to reach that community is another person of color. It's not personal. It doesn't mean you're not doing your job well. It doesn't mean you know there's something wrong with you. There's probably some history there, especially in our elders. They probably you know ha have a little bit of trust issue. Um, if you don't have a person of that same community, the next best person is another minority. And if you don't have another minority, then you bring in somebody that is not a, a minority but understands that culture. And if you absolutely don't have that as well, you partner with somebody. And uh, you know, it, it doesn't matter who gets the credit, it's just, we're trying to serve this community. I need your help. Can you help me meet these numbers or you know, help lower their, their blood pressure, whatever the, the goal might be, but I need your help. I can't do it because I'm less likely to have success if I do this on my own if I'm not a person of color, unfortunately. So, and, and again, you know, this, we're talking about our immigrant populations who, who don't speak English, but this really applies to all, you know, all our minorities. And I know some people don't want to hear that. Well, I'm different, you know, I've known, I, I grew up in that area. Unfortunately, because of the political climate, if you look similar to some of the negativity that's been going on, there's gonna be a trust issue. So if you're truly, truly trying to help the community, that is something that you, ha you ca can't take personal and you really have to look into that. And it might be somebody in your organization or it might be somebody outside the organization. Can you partner with me to do this? Step three, so our leadership. You know, Laura touched on that. All of us have experienced somebody somewhere telling us, sorry, you can't do that. Or you know what, that was a priority last year. We didn't see any results. This year we're moving this way. Oftentimes when you're working with our communities, uh, our immigration, uh, immigrant communities or communities of color, it takes a minute again for that trust. It takes a minute to see those results. So can you talk to somebody that supports your, you know, what you're trying to do? Um, and if, you, if that first person you talk to isn't seeing it, Maybe you, if this is something you're truly passionate about, can you go to somebody else? Can you say, hey, look, can you help me? And it doesn't have to be negative, like I'm telling on so-and-so he didn't want to help me. You know, hey, maybe can I get your other perspective on you know, this work that I'm trying to do and see who might support you. Um, and if you, know, you, you keep trying and nothing happens, try to do whatever they're telling you to do and find a way to do it on the side while not you know, messing up what you're supposed to do, right? Because <laughs> sometimes I, I, they just don't get it, and, and it's not that they're trying to be, you know, um, malicious or blocking that they, they, you know, everybody's got their own leadership that's guiding them and their own, you know, parameters that they have to stick to. Um, and, you know, speaking of that, so, and, you know, sometimes we don't want to do that. Some, uh, we don't want to talk about the parameters, the numbers we got to meet, because, well, you know, you're so insensitive, like, you just care about the numbers, how rude. But you know, if we're honest, we gotta keep the doors open, right? Our companies need to get the funding for whatever it is, you know, however they get it. So let's try to meet those parameters and if we're truly serving the community the way the community needs to be served, we will meet those numbers without having to even speak about those numbers. Um, and again, just talking to the right person that can help you do that. And because a lot of us are so passionate about it, we need somebody to guide us to stay in those parameters, you know? I wish I could send my leadership, can I just send you all the happy faces that I saw? Like really, you need more than that? Yeah, you know, they do. So, so who can support you, you know, to stay in that area of the parameters? So once you've got all that, events, right? So now we want to partner, you know, we got our partners, we got our idea of how we're going to reach this community, who's going to support us. The best thing to do is events. Again, you know, as was mentioned before, nobody's going to come just to sit down. You know, maybe one person might come, I shouldn't say nobody, but, <laughs> you know, most people are not going to come just to hear insurance. What's fun about this, you know, what, social, you know, socialization, you know, being lonely is a huge, huge health issue um, that impacts our immune system. You know, research is showing that, you know, people that are um, isolated and lonely tend to have more illness, right? We don't know if it's because they're not going to the doctor because they're sad or, or because it truly affects their immune system, but let's make it fun. And then while you're having fun, find a way to, you know, share your health literacy mission. So, you know, some of the things that, you know, we've done is sewing 
sewing classes, meal programs, Zumba classes, movies. I mean, there's so many ideas you can talk to the community you're trying to work with. What would sound fun to you guys? Let's see if we can make it happen, a dance, you know, whatever it might be. Um, so yeah, that's, that's some you know, ideas. I don't know if anybody wants to share something you guys have done that maybe really worked for you guys when you were trying to reach certain communities. Erica, can you repeat anything anyone says so they can pick it up on the recording? So if someone oh, says something, sure. you just Thank you. Nobody wants to share? <coughs> we're all shy, we're all hungry, right? We want to get to lunch? Go ahead. Um, we work with uh, adult refugees. Uh, one component is um, those 60 and older uh, wanting to obtain citizenship and needing to obtain citizenship for their SSI benefits. So we've gone through this whole process that you've spoken about and it worked, it's worked out very well. Uh, we were in an elder senior center uh, that worked exceptionally well. They lacked space at one point. We moved to our uh, organization. I'm now wanting to move back toward an elder center where there is space, they serve immigrants and refugees, and it seems like a perfect fit. My main comment is your lovely poster, I hope is gonna help me persuade uh, the move from our center to the elder center, um, so thanks. Awesome. And Thank I'd love you. a colored copy if I can. Sure. Thank you for one. sharing. Yeah. Uh huh. We'll, we'll make it happen. It's more like a, um, two comments. Um, one, um, I do can relate to some of uh, to your story. Um, as a Latina, I've been there. Also, I moved into the, this country, knowing um, probably zero to non English. So, and I had to learn. Um, that was almost 22 years ago. Now, with that said, one thing um, I do tell people when I talk, to, uh, when I talk about outreach into um, Latinos, um, there is a misconception, and I'm pretty sure many, uh, many in the room have been in that position or have heard someone saying that they think because you're a Latino, because you're a black or Asian, or what have you, uh, you're an expert in all things Latinos, Asians, blacks. <laughs> and I said, and my, my answer to that is, I'm not even an expert on me. So that's, um, and, and that's a very common misconception that we get. And I'm Puerto Rican, but that doesn't mean that I'm gonna come into a Mexican household and say, this is what you need to do. Exactly. Because, you know, yes, we do speak the same language, but that doesn't mean that we share the same overall culture. So I do advise people all the time to keep that in mind. That's very important be respectful and be mindful that there are certain languages that you have to be, you know, it means different things in different countries depending on where you're from. The second comment I have is, which happens to me almost every day at work, is um, the constant battle with people that don't wanna um, help or don't wanna um, support you um, working with um, minorities and diverse communities. Well. I'm, I don't speak um, Chinese, for example. I'm not gonna, you know, I can I can upload your your um, your fact sheet because I don't I don't speak the language. Well, the fact sheet is complete. All you need to do is copy paste. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Simple. However, the one thing I do I do tell people, you don't need to speak Chinese or any other language to care. That's not exclusive. That's and. I don't speak Asian languages or any other language besides Spanish, but that doesn't mean I don't care and I don't want to work with those communities. And Absolutely. I don't want to do you know, what is right because we do share, uh, we do have more in common than differences. So. Absolutely. Well, thank you for the work you do. Yeah. Th thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, and one thing I've learned, unfortunately, is you can't make you can't make somebody care. Either they do or they don't. And I've actually had Latinos tell me, I'm not trying to do that work. I'm just trying to move up in the company or I'm just trying to, I'm not trying to make anybody mad because they don't, you know, that, that's a touchy subject and I'm not gonna make myself look bad by, you know, focusing on it. And that's okay, you know, that's, that's your area and, and let me focus, just don't block me when I do care and I'm trying to do the work. So absolutely, thank you for your comment. Working with so small community sometimes, they all know each other. 
So how do you handle the gossiping and like, oh, I'm not going because she's going and she's going to spill the soup on me? How do you manage that? I have in my community, most of them are Hmong, but I have two Vietnamese ladies there. Um, they don't get along. So someday I would say, oh, did you call her? Don't talk to me about her, honey. I said, okay. <laughs> and then I would not talk about it until she said, oh, did you call her to me? And I said, oh, yeah, I did call her. You know, it's, it's up to her mood. It's up to her situation that she wanted to know. In the Hmong community, I think, I think the gossiping is I can't control. I do this if you want to come, come. We, have, do, we do have some rooms, say, they say, come here, talk about this. You can go, to your, go back home and talk about when you come here, what is help you, what does, doesn't help you. But we don't talk about gossiping. So if they talk about gossiping, I will go to them and say, let's not talk about other. Talk about ourselves, why we are here is important for us. And they, they will stop. So you almost kind of listen to the conversation a little bit here and there. You do that for a while, they know that when they come there not to gossip, they will not gossip. So I, it's, it's kind of hard, it's kind of hard, but um, um, it's really because of Hmong people is also uh, really family oriented. They know each other. Either you are the sister-in-law, you are the auntie, or you are the um, aunt only. Um, so they know each other, they know the story of each other at home, who's a bad person, who's a good person. And when they are there, they have to set aside that story. But if that really happening and they cannot get along, I tend that one of them will not be there. That's all. Um, I was just curious if you've ever tried, um, you said you had some women in the group who have some proficiency, uh, liter literary, literacy proficiency, and um, are a little bit more able than skilled, um, like with reading calendars and whatnot. If you've ever tried asking any of them if they'd be willing to help you do something like the calls on Mondays, or um, I, I, I just imagine that would give them a, a, a sense of agency and um, would even make the, the community element a little bit stronger. Yes, by working with them for three months, so I know who can call who, or remind who. I might just call one person and say, can you call so-and-so? They might live close by them or might be relative to them. Then they will call that and I will short of two people that I don't have to call. So I'll do that. But some of them, um, even them, they, they themselves don't remember that they have to be there on Tuesday. So I have to call that person only. And sometimes some people don't want to call that person. So you kind of have to know the history a little bit, who can call who and who won't call who in order for you to use that kind of calling directions. So, yeah. So, like, are you guys deciding to expand this to like another location? Like Sheboygan is a yeah, pretty Yeah, we large have plots place. to take over the whole world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so actually we have some things in the works. Um, one is we just got a small, a mini grant of like $2,500 to start a garden to supplement the diets of these women the Hmong women that we're currently serving. And as Neng Li mentioned, we'd like to move toward inviting the men once we have a male a Hmong educator of some sort, community member who's willing to step forward because it's a bit of a cultural issue to have the women invite the men and teach them. So um, that's one. And then we also have in Manitowoc County, about 5% of our population is Hmong, about 5% is Latino. So that the Latino community is another that we'd like to work on inviting. Um, and it's, you know, all of us have things in the backs of our minds, people that we like and, peop and groups that we'd like to reach out to. So these things will evolve, but that's where we are now. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, I add to, you talk about different county. Um, my job, I only, because the diocese only covered the Northeast Wisconsin, so my job is only covering Mentawa, Green Bay, Appleton to Ashka. So that's the area I can work with. That. Sheboygan is not diocese territory, so I cannot work at So it have to be people in Sheboygan have to work at it. Uh, I think she is mainly in some her county she can work with that. But we focus on the population, where are there? 
Um, I do have a, uh, another step work in Green Bay. I also have an elder group. I started with the elder group in 1998, and she's kind of still continued that group. And like I gave it, then she uh, continued after I left. Uh, I still go um, talk to them here and there, but that because we provide food, we cook our own food so the food tastes much better. We didn't go to the um, aging disability to cater in and do all this uh, cooking, so we cook our foods much better. And then, and then um, uh, we have that group has been going on for 20 years, but because we use Salvation Army's um, transportation and locations, and we provide people and we provide food. So that is about 25 to 30 people come AB, AB, we do twice a month. Um, so another word answer your question, we only can uh, focus, expand to the area that we can cover only. So like Sheboygan into Fond du Lac is not our county, so we really cannot go in that direction. But if anybody in Sheboygan want to work in that area, we are happy to help them out too. Correct. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. Is that many of us have counterparts in other aid, in other counties. Yep. So I think that is the end of our time. If you have questions, we'll stick around for a bit and answer them, if possible. It was wonderful of you all to attend. I appreciate I appreciate you being here. <laughs>